We are Steel Magnolias, two sisters who love family, traditions, and all things Southern. We've got plenty of room at our table, so pull up a chair. Hey, Lainey. Hi, Laura Beth. Well, I thought it was really funny that a couple of episodes ago, when we talked about potato salad, yep. we had a listener that said, I really wish you would have given a disclaimer before starting into that, that we were going to get hungry, <laughs> which is true. I remember recording that episode and how hungry I was for potato salad or really anything. <laughs> As we spoke about it. Especially so, when you get descriptive like roasted potato. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so I completely understood his point and his um, request for that. So today, disclaimer, disclaimer. <laughs> we're about to make y'all real hungry. Because we're only talking food today. Because it's all food <laughs> and it's some good ones. So today we're talking about meat and threes and cobblers. Mm-hmm. And um, oh, this I'm smiling as I'm saying this because this is is just so southern. Well, I'm smiling too because as we speak, I have ribs smoking, Heck and yes, so we're do. about to have some good food. Yes, so we can we can get hungry because we have food. To the ceramic A is smoking <laughs> outside. Um, yeah, so a meat and three. We're gonna we're diving all into specifics today. Um, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a restaurant where you pick a meat and three sides. That's right. Um, but the history behind that I thought was interesting because I think most Southern cultural history is it's interesting. interesting. Yes. Um, no one knows for sure when the first meat and threes sprouted up in the South, but I read a little bit from John John T. Edge, who is the director of Southern Foodways Alliance. Okay. And if you haven't heard of Southern Foodways Alliance, you can... Look them up. They actually have a podcast as well called Gravy, mm-hmm. and they are constantly... It's good. They don't do it super often. I know. But it's good. Yeah. So, well, and especially if you were maybe new to it, you could probably feel like it's That's frequent because you, 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 could you could space them out <laughs> um, as far as when you listen. But the Southern Foodways Alliance is really at the helm of telling different culturally significant um, pieces of history yeah. in the South. So, John T. Edge shared a little bit about. I think just, he's the co-founder of that too. So very passionate. Okay, okay. Well, he says as the Southern worker transitioned from farm to city, that you saw this meal arise. This meal being the meat and three. He says um, to him, a meat and three is the example of country to city transition, farm to urban transition. This would have been the first few decades of the 20th century in and around emerging cities such as Nashville and Atlanta. You really saw this sprouting up. But it was food for people who plowed the back 40, uh, reinterpreted for people who worked at desks and in factories. Okay. So this is people that are now catching lunch breaks in the city instead of returning home for lunch. Yeah, don't have time to go all the way home and... Yeah. Have that meal you're used to. Right. So we're going to bring it to you in the city. Yeah. But this is not a sit down, you know, experience with passing a, bowls of a waiter or, I mean, yes. this is oh, yeah, yeah. grab a cafeteria style tray, right. move through the line. So it really is a nice stepping stone. If you're used to going home for lunch uh-huh. and you're used to that home cooking, if you have to now go out for lunch... You don't want to, well, first of all, you don't have the money to sit down and and order off of a menu Do with tips lawyers and, and doctors. That. Right. Um, you might have the money or make yourself have the money budget for that to eat out, but still kind of this is the middle road, I would think. Well, this. and I love that this very thing that we're talking about, about a meet and three, uh-huh. is it's very much everybody coming together you stand in the same line, no matter who you are. Yeah. You pick up the same tray, no matter who you are. Like, you've got your, you know, white-collar businessman or politician next to the policeman or yes. factory worker. Like, no matter what, this is the... Yep. We're all going to do this the same way. Exactly. I love that. It is. It is very equalizing. That's, That's a right. great point. Yeah, we're all... <laughs> We're all eating off the same trays. That's right. Same rolled silverware. Yeah. 
getting the same scoop of mac and cheese. That's and, right. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. Um, yeah. So should I what should I share the meat and three options? Or did yeah, you want to okay. go for it? So like, this is what you would typically find. Again, meat and three is exactly what it sounds. You pick a meat, <laughs> and, you, pick, you know, you pick your protein, and you pick your uh, three sides. And I think we're also now in the south. Uh, yeah, it's called a meat and three, kind of meaning vegetables. But in the South, Those that could also mean your sides are not starches, vegetables. jello yeah. based. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so typical meats you would see in a meat and three fried chicken, meatloaf, country fried steak, roast beef, liver and onions, fried catfish, sugar cured ham, yep. and chicken and dumplings. Yep. Those are great ones. Yeah. My pick, if I were going through, would either be fried chicken or meatloaf. Yeah. Those are kind of my go-tos. Depends on what the meatloaf looks like. But yes, <laughs> for me. But okay. I- <laughs> so then you get to pick three of any of these items. And some of this is seasonal, you know, seasonality would play into this. But for the most part, like you're going to see this stuff year round. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Which is another reason I love this. Um, okay. So green beans, fried okra. Coleslaw, fried green tomatoes, collard greens, black-eyed peas, creamed corn, mashed potatoes, applesauce, turnip greens, boiled cabbage, Mm -hmm. canned yams, baked squash, pinto beans, cornbread, rice, cooked or baked apples, Mm -hmm. pickled beets, and mac and cheese. I put mac and cheese last because that's the one that Southerners get the most slack on. And seeing like that calling that a vegetable, a um, yeah, it's a vegetable. <laughs> well, and I think you're also going to see a little bit of regional influence on that as well. Like, yes, I would say all of those are those true are staples. Yeah, um, in and around Charleston, you might have something more like red rice and okra together. Okay, yeah, yeah, um, that's like true. a stew. They'll do things like that in that area. On the western fringes um, of the South, more near Austin or something like that, you might see. Well, you mentioned country fried steak, but I think that's real popular. Yeah, there. that's true. Um, Louisiana, you're going to have that Cajun influence of the rice and gravy-based dishes. Yeah. Um, and sometimes in Louisiana and Mississippi, they use the term plate lunch instead of meat and three, but it's the same, it's thing. same thing. Yeah. So you might see a little regional. Yeah. So here's why all of this is, I, I don't know, there's so much, you know, smartness around all of this but i do think there's a couple of things that work really well here um for one as a kitchen you're not really making all that much food like you're making a large quantity of food Uh but you know like when you go to the cheesecake factory or some of these restaurants that have like 20 page menus it's so overwhelming i'm like what does this kitchen look like i know like there's and can they be. actually do all of these things well? Probably not. I mean, I'm sure they don't. Um, so just even from like a setup and operation standpoint, mm-hmm. I'm like simple is definitely better here. Yeah, but yet you're feeling like there's tons of options because you're getting to pick and customize right. as the customer. That's it's, true. It is what you wanted. Yeah, you know. You get now options. usually in those things too, I would say. You know, it's kind of like they've got this much. So, hey, we're out of mac and cheese. Yeah. You're just out. Yeah. Like, it's not like if you'll wait an hour, we'll have more. No, when we're out, we're out. We're out, yeah. Yeah, and that can be frustrating. Because <laughs> a lot of these places are places that people frequent regularly. Yeah. So you get attached to whatever you're your order is. you're excited about getting your whatever. Yeah fried cream cream style corn and they're out of it so i think it's pretty brilliant from an operation standpoint i think it's pretty brilliant for um families because now that i have a kid i know Mm -hmm. of sharing a lot of meals Mm -hmm. with him so i mean a lot of these sides are very kid friendly absolutely And some places even have just a veggie plate option. Yeah, that's a good point. Where you can do four vegetables. Like instead of a meat curry, like you can do just four vegetables or something. And that might even be better. Which works for vegetarians. It Mm -hmm. works for kids that that you're trying to um, share a meal with. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it works even as... It's ingenious for as an employee. Like, it's less stuff you have to remember Mm -hmm. on the menu. I mean, I know we're not talking about really, like, servers coming to a table 
that have to know a menu well. Yeah. Like, most of this is, like we said early on, cafeteria style. Yeah. But, I mean, you got to know at least what you're serving. And if that's not changing out a lot, there's not, like, a lot of specials for the day to yeah. memorize. I mean, all of that stuff. There's a lot of, you're right. The like, there's not a how do you want that cooked? No. It's cooked. It is what it is. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, anyway, I just think. And I don't know if we said this early on, but... Um, most of this is lunch. Some of these are open for dinner. Some of the establishments, and we're going to talk about some of the best ones around. But primarily, this it's is a lunch. This thing. is a lunch yeah. meal. Um, so I found um, a list of some good ones. You found a couple of lists. I did. I have two some different good lists. lists. We cross-referenced <laughs> all of our lists and came up with the three that netted Made out every list. of the three lists. So we're going to for sure mention those. And then there's also ones that are popular that um, are worth worth noting as well. So, And you can let us know your favorite. Absolutely. As well in your state yeah. or your city. Um, so this first one that is in our hometown, I'm embarrassed to say I've actually never been to. Well. So I do need to We visit. need to do it. And I tried to go recently, and the line was so long, and I was on a limited time frame. That's what you so have to be prepared for it's no matter what time if you go here. So Arnold's Country Kitchen yep. in Nashville, Tennessee, opened in the early 80s and is a staple meet and three. Um, Very simple cinder block building, like not fancy at all on 8th Avenue. But, I mean, it received the James Beard Classics Award. Yeah. This is this, this place, it's been on Food Network's Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives. It's it's known. It's now. very known. It's yeah, That's one of the places that Anthony Bourdain hit when oh, he was yeah. here. And yeah. I miss him. Yeah, so Arnold's was on all the lists that we consolidated. <laughs> of course, right. we've heard about it a lot, that it, this being in our hometown. Another thing I love about all these is this meet and three is usually around ten dollars. Oh, good point. You know, I price mean, point. I think Arnold's is nine seventy four or something like that. Like it's usually ten bucks. Yeah. for a very hearty meal. Yeah, that's so awesome. It really is. Yeah, I mean. Chick Fil A's that much, you know. That's, I know. So, yeah, I wonder if that includes your iced tea, sweet tea. Oh, good question. I'm not sure, but I bet it's not much. Yeah, to add that on. Okay, um, and it's uh, a Monday through Friday place. It's not open on the weekends. Arnold's, is yeah. It? Oh, that's it's good. To Monday know. through Friday, so it's hitting that work crowd. Do you have its hours? Is it lunch? Ten thirty to two forty five. See, lunch. And only. I mean, if you're getting in line at two thirty, forget it. Like, yeah, if you're, you're not, getting in line at ten thirty, though. The way I just said that is correct. There's probably a line mm-hmm. at 1030. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it's good. Okay. The other one that made all three lists is Bertha's Kitchen yep. in Charleston, South Carolina. I have never been. Never been there, but we needed to make sure and mention them. And then the final one to mention that made all the lists is in a suburb of Birmingham in Homewood, Alabama, Johnny's Restaurant. Johnny's. Yeah, so Johnny's is known for their squash casserole, um, their caramelized onions and rice, and what is this? And cheese under a... Oh, caramelized onions. I'm sorry, this is all the squash casserole. This sounds so good. Oh, my. Caramelized onions, rice, and cheese under a buttery blanket of Ritz crackers and Parmesan. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> so, so good. And then Bertha's is known for their okra soup. Which is very low country. Thing. Okay. So that's. That makes um, sense then. And Arnold's, it mentions in this list the meatloaf ladled with rich tomato gravy is Ooh, I would love something that. to try. So, all that's right. What I would There's go the with one there. that made all three lists. Now, as we were preparing, or I was preparing, we, we usually prepare separately and then come together to produce these shows. As I was preparing for this, I actually went and sat at Puckett's. Oh, I love it. Here in Franklin. <laughs> and Puckett's made the list. Of I love it. The ones I looked at. I looked at a list um, from southernthing.com, which is 20 Southern meat and threes to try before you die. Oh, that's cute. So um, I did want to mention Puckett's just since I had uh, literally sat in their restaurant as I prepared for this show today. Well, the list I was looking at was from the American Southfield Guide again. Okay. It has a list in 
touches probably every state in the South. Um, another one that I've been to that made their list was Mary Max Tea Room in Atlanta. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, I, that was on the list I saw, too. Yeah. And it also says Safe Room for Cobbler, which we're going to talk about hey. in a moment. Um, yeah. So, Do you remember what you got at Mary Max? I don't. It's probably been a while. It's been a while. But yeah. it's a staple there yeah. in Atlanta. has been yeah. for, there for a long time. Um, one of the ones I saw on the list I looked at, which uh, I forget about, but you and I both have been to, the Whistle Stop Cafe. In Juliet, Georgia. Yeah. Yes. So um, Whistle Stop Cafe was a general store that then was turned into the Whistle Stop Cafe for Fanny Flagg's um, movie, Fried movie Green Tomatoes. that was turned into a movie production and remained open. Um, and we went and visited several years ago in the 90s, probably. Yep. Had some fried green tomatoes. It was yummy. Such a tiny town. Like, there's a few things that were shown in the movie there, but it's not much of a yeah. town. Yeah, you would probably be going for that reason. I don't think you'd be passing through. And another one that was on one of the lists I looked at um, that you and I have been to even recently was the Elliston Street, the Elliston Square Soda Shop. Oh, yeah. They do meet and three That's there. That's true. As well. I think of it more as an ice cream soda I shop. I do, too. But yeah. they do a meet and three there. And Okay. Elliston yeah. Place. Yeah. And I think they had a second location, Elliston Place, that opened up here, but didn't make it or I maybe it is making it i don't know I don't know. but if you see two listings we're make talking sure about you're the talking, nashville yeah, one that's yeah. the original and the staple one there's actually a meet and three that i had never heard of this wasn't on any of the lists because it's no longer open but one of the earliest known meet and threes was a 49 seat diner in nashville called hap towns restaurant okay i hadn't heard of it until i did this research on as well yeah so it's named after the um father son who ran it and the business evolved from a hot dog cart in the 1920s um to you know a small stone building with a coal oil stove that the pair opened up after the founder or the younger excuse me younger towns returned home from the war so um they were meeting that need of they were and they were known for getting up at like 3 30 in the morning or getting going not getting up getting going at 3 30 and four in the morning to start cooking breakfast, putting on pots of vegetables and cooking on Making the stove for lunch. And, yeah. Um, they didn't actually call it a meat and three, like you mentioned earlier. They called it a plate lunch. Okay. Back in those days. But um, yeah, pretty much the same manner for almost 65 years is what I heard or what I've read that the two Hap Townses of Nashville served up, you know, the Southern. Southern cooking for a long line of faithful and appreciative customers. Hap the Elder started the tradition in 1921, um, like I said, with a curbside eatery on wheels, which was basically a hot dog cart. And um, the younger Hap, I love that name, um, took up the spoon and spatula when he returned from war in 1946. Together they built the cafe and... um, I think it probably ended. I think they. I think the son retired in 1985. Okay. So this was just about the time our family was coming to Nashville. Well, no, I guess we were no, here. We've been there 15 years in 1985. Oh, that's true. Yeah. So, but that's about the time Arnold's is. Get that's going. true. Yeah, it, you said are eighty one. Yeah, about eighty one. So see, it's... once it closed, Arnold's had all the crowd. That's come true. In. You know, once that one was closed, yeah, we'll all go over here, and it kind of got it even going. Yeah. So, so the younger Hap Towns passed away in two thousand twelve. Okay. Um, so they oh, are no longer. I'm glad we mentioned. I'm glad you mentioned that. with us. But yeah, they it sounds like one they of the pioneers. were definitely an original and pioneer. Yeah, of that movement. Well, meet and three. You got me wanting a meet and three now. I know, and I didn't realize. Like I was just inquiring of a friend in Charleston. Like, what are some good meet and threes? She didn't know what I meant. So I don't. I think. Wow. I okay. think meet and three maybe does need to be mentioned, even just for the sake of. I don't know if it's just that universally of a known 
term or if it's just one that we say a lot. Well, she needs to get to Bertha's Kitchen then. Um, she said, I guess we don't have any. I was like, oh, oh yes, no, you I guarantee do. you have some. Bertha's Kitchen is probably off the charts good. This is what the field guide says. Gullah-inspired, sister-run institution oh. with fried whiting, pig's feet, and okra soup, which oh, wow. I mentioned the okra soup. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I bet it is true low country yeah. food. Uh, but this field guide has them listed in, you know, all different cities. Jackson, Mississippi, Memphis, Montgomery. Um, so They're all over. Check them out. They're, yeah. And I think, yeah, I think sometimes we forget that some restaurants offer a meat and three option. Like a Puckett's. Yeah, or Cracker Barrel. Yes, or Cracker something Barrel. Like great that. example. Yeah. Like they, they do have that They may option. not be a meat and three, but yeah. they may offer yeah. a meat and three meat option. And three. So it can kind of be. But, you know, as I think about uh, these literal meat and three restaurants, they're usually not dinner places. Exactly. They're only lunch. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, so if you're trying to decipher if it's a true meet and three, just look at their store hours. <laughs> that's right. If it's a lunch joint, that's probably a meet and three. Yeah. Um, well, after you've stuffed yourself with um, a meet and three you vegetables may not have or any sides, room left. <laughs> but if you do, may we suggest a cobbler? Oh. Um, so the cobbler is a dish consisting of a fruit or a savory filling, but usually a fruit. In a large baking dish that's covered with a batter, like a biscuit or dumpling, before mm-hmm. being baked. And in the South, they oftentimes resemble a thick, crusted, deep dish pie. Yeah. Both on top and bottom, yep. you usually see yep. um, the crust. So, blackberry cobbler is my favorite, but I really love all cobblers. <laughs> like, it, it doesn't matter what the special is. You know, like a lot of menus will say cobbler of the day. Um, uh-huh. I usually ask what's coming, but it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. It's not going to change my order. I'm just getting whatever the cobbler of the day is. Um, And so we're going to talk about some recipes, but I will say, I mean, I don't care what fruit you're eating in your cobbler, but you really need it served warm with with a scoop of (laughs) vanilla vanilla ice ice cream. cream. (laughs) That's right. And I like to eat mine with a strong cup of coffee too. Ooh, yeah, so this is that makes my sounding really good. My cobbler experience complete. Well, I think cobblers got really big in the South because we have a lot of good fruit. That's true. Like we just have a lot of good yeah. seasonal yeah. fruit that grows here. So it's just another something to do. And with what do you, you know? If it all comes ripe at the same time, yeah, you can make a salad with it. You can, but you're looking for ways. Yeah, we to, can it to we use jam it, jam it, jelly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I, I do think true. that's one reason cobblers got popular. Yeah. And another reason I think is you almost always have a little sugar, a little flour, a little butter in your pantry. Yeah. So if you've got the fruit, you've pretty much got what you need what to you make need. this thing. Yeah, they're pretty simple to make. Yeah. I mean, in terms of the baking world. Yeah. Like they're probably one of the simpler ends of things you could do. You're not And it's kind of similar to what some people call a crumble. Uh-huh. Which you know, is fruit often fruit yes. based and has sometimes a, some oats in it as well. Yeah, but the yeah. cobbler is so good. Yeah. Anyway, so you got some recipes. Well, I have a, a section in my. I know. Dessert. I, see you, I see you have your binder out. I wish y'all I could my see binder. Lainey's three ring binder. Of I have many three ring binders, but this pages. is my cobbler section. Oh my god! So I have a section. <laughs> Um, but you said blackberry is your favorite. Peach is my favorite. Okay. I love a good peach cobbler. And I've mentioned before, my go-to is Southern Living. It should be. For recipes. Yeah. This is from June 2010. But they have a peach pecan cobbler oh, that I, I really like. The like. Sound of that. And the way they do um, is, you know, you're making a flour mixture that goes in the cobbler, but then they do a pie crust that's cut... Oh, cool. Across the okay. top of the casserole dish. And I think it's cute. It's pretty. And yeah. yummy. Yeah. So that's one that I like to make. Okay. Um, Do you have a preferred presentation that you like to see cobblers presented in? Do you know what I mean? Like, cause I you could do it. You could do it in a baking dish. Yeah. You could do it in a cast Depends iron skillet. On how, like, I have one recipe that I make that is... Um, 
I do it in individual containers that's because it has favorite. like a biscuit on top. That's like my a, favorite. Yeah. <laughs> and so I just think it looks so stinking cute and a little individualized thing. Well, and they have those small cast iron skillets that you can get. That's adorable. I don't have any of those, but a those lot of restaurants, either. that's how they serve it. Yeah. It's adorable. Precious. Adorable. And then put that ice cream scoop on there and it's just perfection. But yeah. Um, so peach pecan cobbler. That yeah, that's good. a good one. It okay. has, you know, the nutmeg and vanilla and all that wonderfulness. But, uh, you know, I like the pecans in there, too. Well, I found one for black. Like I mentioned, I love blackberry. So I found one that I haven't made, but that sounds so good. This is from Kelly Fields. She's a well-known pastry chef out of New Orleans. And she's got um, one that, well, her restaurant is Willa Jean. Willa Jean. Hers is a blackberry and bourbon cobbler. Okay, Hi. girl. Do I have your attention? You got me. Um, I actually found this in Southern Living's um, 50th anniversary issue that was okay. 2016. Okay. I kept that. I mean, uh-huh. I keep a lot of my Southern Livings, but I definitely kept that one because it, it had, was thicker. It and had a lot of like, here's the, the classic. Of the cross. These are yeah. the tops yeah. of these, these and these. So it was in a list of um, desserts or um you know, recipes that they wanted to make sure and mention. But one thing she mentions in hers is turbinado Uh sugar. That's just a, it's just a thicker sugar, Mm -hmm. right? Okay. They have it even at Kroger. Okay. But I think it's, um, kind of in the brown sugar family. So it's, Is, does she put Maybe. it on top at the I end? I think so, yeah. So a lot of times you'll do like an egg white okay. to kind of make it stick on. Oh. And then that sugar. Have you ever seen a I've dessert s- that has like bigger sugar chunks? Yeah. And it's kind of stuck I thought it was raw sugar, though, usually that's on there. Th- this sounds a little different. Well, I don't know all my. Yeah. But no, you're really I've good bought at this, the turbinado though. sugar, and it's coarse. Yeah. And it shows up on there nicely. Yeah. And I think it has like a molasses kind of flavor. Mm. Or at least that's what that I was reading great. online. So anyway, her blackberry and bourbon cobbler recipe sounds real good. Well, I've made one that's a blackberry cobbler that I did in the individualized dish. Yeah. That has an almond ginger biscuit on top. Oh, so that's my gosh. Really Are you serious? Good. That sounds I, absolutely I know. I amazing. thought you had had it, but maybe you hadn't. Mom had it. But it has that crystallized ginger in okay. the biscuit that you make. Ooh. So it's pretty yummy. And that sounds good. That's a, a blackberry version. You might want to try that sometime. Yeah. Um, and then another one that I have not made, but okay. I have in here that I would like to try sometime, is called Firecracker Chocolate Cherry Cobbler. Uh-oh. I want you to hear me out and tell me if you think it's it too much. Spice to it? it has cinnamon in it. Okay. Too. So it's um, cocoa powder to give it kind of the chocolatey, uh-huh. the chocolateness. Um, cinnamon. It actually does have chipotle, chipotle uh, chili pepper, mm-hmm. but it's a cherry one. So this is a cherry cobbler. I think this sounds really interesting. And I've, I think it sounds good. It, I Does it sound I, like it's a little too much? It's too adventurous for a cobbler for me. Like, okay. cobblers are one of those places Basic. like potato salad. <laughs> when we had that discussion, I like simple. I can appreciate somebody that's trying to, you know. Do something different. Bring some variety or seasonality to it. But Now, maybe this will make a difference, too. Keep in mind, so the filling is ju- is not all of that. The filling is just sugar flour, um, frozen pitted cherries, that's okay. your that's your cobbler part. Okay. The topping is what has the cocoa and the oh and the kick in it. Oh, okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah and yeah. then it's also served with the ice cream. Right. So it's more your flour part. Yeah. That's got the okay. chocolate and okay. kick in it. Okay. I just think that sounds kind of I yummy. Mean, I wouldn't mind trying that one. Hey. But the other two I have tried. Yeah. And they're both yeah. tried and true. They're good. <laughs> um. So you said peach was your favorite? I just love peach. Yeah. 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 I just think if the peaches are good and ripe, yeah, that's kind of hard to beat for me. Yeah. I had a good peach cobbler when I was at Puckett's researching this. That's that was the their, their cobbler of the day. I know. It was so good. Yeah. Yeah. Just a warm cobbler with cold ice cream. Yeah. So yummy. But I think you usually have to order it with the ice cream. 
Like, I forgot to say it with ice cream. And it didn't have it. So did you say, um, I need ice cream no, to go on No, I didn't this. go back and ask him to Girl. add it. I just, I know. See, that's like a given to me. You don't do cobbler and then not have ice cream. I like, know. that's almost a given to me. Mm-hmm. So, Well, um, are y'all hungry? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I am now. Um would you say anything else about cobblers? Or? I don't. I think that's it. Just I think it's an easy. You know, we talked about doing individualized ones, and that's really cute. But in a big casserole dish, it's so easy. That's usually like, what most recipes call like a thirteen by nine baking dish. Yeah, I, that's just such a great thing. Yeah. for if you're having a group over or yeah. something that you're not going to have to um, do everything. You know. Make sure each piece is cut nicely and all that. It's just an easy scoop it out, throw some ice cream on top. You're good to go. Yeah. That's cool. Well, I think that's going to cover it for meat and threes and cobblers. And um, we do hope that y'all have enjoyed this episode. Be sure and um, give us a rating on Apple Podcasts and share us with your friends. Um, they are podcasters or even if they're not, we've had several people that say, I didn't even listen to podcasts, podcasts, but now I'm hooked. I like listening (laughs) to y'all. So we welcome you to the table each week. That's right. um, Tell your friends we're trying to spread the word. Yeah. Yeah. We, we enjoy meeting with you each week and hope you do the same. So y'all have a good week and we will see you here next time.